Uh, Rita, I'm very, very thankful to be invited to this, uh, to this uh, winter school. As you said, the, the, the relationship with Bologna has been long. I think we've, uh, I started teaching about 10 years ago now. And uh, some of the best students I've had in my lab come from Bologna. And, uh, and I've been very privileged to have this uh, long-standing collaboration with you. So it's a pleasure to be, uh, to be here at this uh, winter school. And it's a pleasure to be talking about what is uh, by far my favorite subject, my favorite topic. It is something on which uh, I've been working for more than 20 years now, I think 25 years. My whole career has been wrapped around the multiple sequence alignment problem. And I hope I managed to convince you of how fascinating and how relevant this problem is in, in, in the management and the analysis of today's data. Uh, a few days ago, you had David Jones. And uh, if, you, uh, if you took him for his words, you thought he was a very, you know, David is so modest that you can easily forget how important and how massive is his contribution. And uh, in, uh, in a few years, when he, when he receives uh, his Nobel Prize, you will realize how modest uh, uh, real scientists are, the best ones. And, uh, and uh, of course, I'm uh, overexcited with uh, what David is doing these days because uh, somehow the prediction of uh, the effective prediction of uh, tertiary structure relies on our capacity to model evolution, to use evolution at its best. And one of the components, it's a small component, you know, somewhere in this big thing they are building, one of the component is multiple sequence alignment. So that's it's very exciting to see that uh, some work I'm so interested in turns out to be relevant in the big picture. I'm gonna to try to share my screen so I can start the presentation. And oops, here we go, we'll go to the first slide. And I'll start now with the presentation. I hope, is everything fine, Pierre? Pierre, can, can you see my slides? Yes, yes? perfect, okay, perfect, excellent. thank you. Okay, so uh, without further ado, let me, uh, let me, let me start with uh, this long, long title, but this is all about the fact that uh, with a lot of data, we have new opportunities. And uh, I would argue, you know, that um, biology as we do it today relies on, the 19th century rediscovery of life diversity, you know, and that's Darwin. And so what do you do when you suddenly have the capacity to travel around the world precisely, knowing exactly where you are, having precise maps? Well, you start building a huge catalog. And when you have this huge catalog, you start organizing your data. And that's what Darwin did. And through this classification emerge natural principles. And that's what Darwin uncovered. For this reason, a lot of us uh, 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 date the birth of modern biology to this uh, process that took place through the 19th century. But ironically, uh, uh, evolution as we use it today, deeply rely on our capacity to compare sequences. And ironically, it's just since a small amount of time that we have sequences for a long time, we have been doing evolutionary biology, pretending we had enough sequences to uncover all of these things, but we did not. We're just beginning to have them. We're beginning to have them because of the improvements in sequencing. So what is happening now, this decade, is probably a rebirth of biology because, uh, you know, in biology, like in any science, whenever you change the apparatus with which you acquire your measurements, you realize that the theory that we're accounting for all your observations, well, they do not account for the new observations and you have to build new theories. And that's what is most likely going to happen. Uh, evolution, molecular evolution, as we understand it, will have to be revisited, which is the fate of any good theory. Now, bear in mind that there is a race going on and there is a race going on between data growth and computer power. As it happens, data growth over to computer power in 2005. Now, this is a very, very relevant thing that we have here because uh, uh, things are getting even worse. You know, since 2011, you can see here the growth of data. So this is a, a logarithmic scale. And so if you're linear on this logarithmic scale, it means that your data is doubling every so often. Well, why not? But then every once in a while, you see, you're not even linear on the logarithmic scale. 
your exponential on the logarithmic scale. And that's, that's super exponential, meaning that your doubling time is shrinking, okay? Now, uh, the doubling time can only shrink to, to some extent, you know, it cannot become negative or we have big, big troubles and it cannot become zero, of course, but it can shrink. And that's what happened, which means that data is now growing much faster than it was growing. Why is this? Well, because uh, if you think about it, uh, um, uh, um, data growth is a collective process, you know, uh, 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 sequencing centers are not like synchrotron. The, the synchrotron cannot be, be built in little pieces and shipped around the world, but sequencing machines can be distributed as much as we want. So on one side, we have the machine that are denser and denser, and that will be pretty much more slow. We'll come to this in a minute. And on the other side, because it's getting cheaper and cheaper, you get more and more and more sequencing machines, which means that every once in a while, when you have a new, uh, a new generation of machines, poof, it, 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 it increases once more, okay? So uh, 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 in the end, the match of the century is really more, which whom you've never seen, probably, I didn't know his face because uh, before looking him up, versus uh, Fred Sanger, and why? Because uh, as you know, uh, uh, Moore uh, was uh, an engineer, I think, at uh, uh, um, uh, Texas uh, Instrument, and uh, he postulated very early that the uh, computational capacities, uh, he was only talking about computation, but this turned out to be true for storage as well, that all of these things will grow exponentially following what has been known so far as Moore's law. And so Moore's law said that uh, computational capacity is going to double every 18 months. And that has kind of been true, you know, even though every once in a while you hear this is finished because uh, we, we cannot make uh, CPU uh, smaller than this. Yeah, there is always an engineering trick and, and yes, it keeps going. But data is now doubling every seven months. You know, this figure is difficult to find and it may be, but that's really much, the data doubling is much faster than the CPU doubling. And that has huge consequences because it means that you have only two solutions if you want to keep doing your job the way you were doing it yesterday. You can buy twice more computers every day. And when I say twice more computers, let's be clear. If the data and the computers were growing at the same pace every year, you'd buy for the same amount of money your computers and they will be twice more powerful. Okay, so you spend, say, uh, 1 million euro, and every year you spend 1 million euro, and you get computers that are twice more powerful, and that allow you to deal with your data in exactly the same amount of time. But if data is doubling faster, and if you have spent 1 million on computers this year, next year you'll have to spend 2 million, the year after 4 millions, 8 millions, and on and on and on, just to be able to do exactly the same thing, you know, have the same effectiveness with your data. And uh, when we talk about data, you know, bear in mind that all of us on this call, within, uh, you know, it's, it's something quite extraordinary to think that a, a, a large fraction of the human population has now undergone PCR test, you know, that's something that was unthinkable a few, a few years ago, even, even two years ago, unfortunately, you know, the fact that we are using uh, 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 um, DNA polymerase techniques is something unprecedented. And of course, we know that all of us around this thread will soon be sequenced on a regular basis. This is unstoppable. This will be huge amounts of data that will need to be processed, that will need to be analyzed. And so this thing of being able to process our data, this is a real bottleneck. But of course, you know, you know the story of the guy asking uh, uh, the king uh, to give him uh, one grain of rice and two grain of rice for a chess board, you know, following the growth of a chess board and the king suddenly realizes that he's been, uh, he's been fooled. Well, we cannot go on this way, which means we have to go on through the other alternative. And the other alternative is efficient algorithmic scale-up, not only to mention uh, saving the rainforest and saving the planet. You know, you know that uh, a stupid amount of uh, uh, computation, a stupid amount of electricity is now being used to mine bitcoins. Eh? Because as you know, the, the closer you go to the maximum number of bitcoins you could have, the more CPU you need to identify the last bitcoins. And I think 
I read some stupid figures like 5% of the world electricity used for Bitcoins. But uh, on a more concrete uh, basis, uh, I think it was five or six years ago, DBI was limited in its growth because they could not have enough electricity to increase the number of computers. And even if they had the space to put more computers because the computers get denser, they require more electricity. And you know, your electric grid is limited. So we need better algorithm. We need more efficient algorithms because uh, we cannot spend the money, we cannot spend the energy. So we have to improve these things. So, but uh, wait a minute, you know, what are we going to do with all this data? Why do we need to have all this data? And so let me go back to Darwin. So now uh, this is a very famous example. This is Darwin's finches. You know, Darwin looked at the beak of the finches in the Galapagos Island and he figured out that something, some underlying process was taking place. Now, uh, um, Darwin was not the first to classify things. And if you look hard enough, you're gonna find things that look like trees, okay? So this is not the genius of Darwin, this classification. He was doing pretty much what everybody was doing around him. No, the genius of Darwin was to understand that there was a hidden process that could account for all this diversity. And this process was evolution. He didn't have the molecular concept, he did not have the genetic concept, but he had the intuition that hidden to us, a unified process was generating all the diversity we were observing. And that this generation of diversity was uh, was happening under um, was happening under under a selection. Okay, and in many ways, what we have here is one incarnation of uh, hidden Markov models, where you observe your data, and you know that below your data there is a process hidden to you that you can reconstruct by observing the data, by observing the product of this process. So this was very very powerful. Uh, um, but uh, there is so much you can do with um, there is so much you can do with phenotypes, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, I understand that by the end of the twenties, you know, by 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 the time uh, uh, genetics was connected to evolution, the Darwinism was a little bit out of fashion because people, you know, had come to the limits of what they could do with this approach, and they didn't know how to go further. And it's really the connection between genetics and evolution, the evolutionary theory that brought back a lot of pace, a lot of momentum. And the real secret was to figure out how to connect evolution and molecular data. This was really a breakthrough. But of course, for this, you needed molecular data. And this did not happen before the end of the 50s and the 60s. That's when we started having sequences. And so the, the unit of analysis now for evolutionary work is really a multiple sequence alignment. A multiple sequence alignment, is which you're going to see here, your sequences align and you're going to see that some colons exhibit less variation than other colons. This is revealing, you know, this thing is very powerful because it reveals something normally invisible to us. It reveals the constraints under which all of these sequences have been evolving. Now, in many ways, uh, I, I, I liken these multiple alignments to uh, you know, when you have uh, these James Bond movies and uh, James Bond has to go and uh, open a safe and uh, there is usually a crisscross of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 X-ray or, or, or uh, infrared beams. And so he usually have powder in his hand and he sprinkles it in the air and suddenly everything becomes visible and he can slip through. Well, this is exactly what this multiple alignment is doing. It's making visible something that is normally invisible. It is throwing powder onto these columns to reveal that this position here cannot change while this position here can change, okay? I have another, so, so to convince you of how important our multiple sequence alignment, there is this paper that was run by Nature in a, a, a few years ago. And so they said, if you print the first page of every paper in the world, you know, everything that has been published since the 19th century, you're gonna get something as high as a Kilimanjaro. And so the height of the Kilimanjaro, I can't remember, but I think it's 5,600 meters or something like this. And so this is just a stack of all the first pages of all the papers published since the beginning of time. And if you look at the, so uh, ironically, uh, half of these papers were actually never cited, okay? And only a small number of people had, uh, you know, uh, uh, over a uh, hundred citations. 
a very, very tiny, you know, this is really a zip distribution, a tiny number of papers had a large number of citations. And at the time, Cluster W, one of the first widely used multiple aligner developed by Des Higgins, who was my PhD supervisor, uh, Cluster W was number 10. So among the 10 most widely cited papers in all areas of science, number 10 was a relatively recent paper, 1994. If I had been lucky, I arrived in the lab in 1995. If I had been lucky, I would have arrived in the lab on that year. And if I had done a little bit of benchmarking, I would be on this paper. That's OK. Uh, I'm on other nice papers with tests, actually, which we, we, which were nicely cited, like Ticofi, which is much less. Ticofi, I think, is uh, six or 7,000 citations now, and uh, which is still uh, quite decent. But but this thing this thing is huge, and then you know if you put together all the cluster papers, I think it's in the hundred or hundred and fifty thousand. So uh, th these numbers mean nothing, but they just reflect the importance of these methods in biology. There are very few things happening in biology that do not require, at one point or another, the assembly of a multiple sequence alignment. And this is beginning. Is this is getting even more obvious with things as alpha fold two by. Uh, by, by Google and David Jones, which, which really show that using well using evolutionary information can crack about every problem we have. Uh, um, uh, a very important application is, of course, phylogeny, because we, we really are reinventing phylogeny, and that's under the pressure of multiple sequence alignment. Now, why are multiple sequence alignments so useful? What do they tell us about biology? And I'd like to give you this, uh, this, uh, this small example, which some of you may be familiar with. It's one of my favorite examples. It's actually a true story. And that's one of the most powerful image we have for, uh, to explain what a multiple sequence alignment captures. So this is a true story. This is um, Abraham Wald who worked on aircraft survivability. And so this guy was asked during the Second World War, to figure out a way to strengthen the plane, an objective way to strengthen the plane. So he did something very simple. So this is not a Second World War plane. That's the same idea. And he did something very simple. Every time a plane was going for a mission, when the plane was coming back, Wald will record on a map here, on the, on the plan, uh, on a piece of paper, I mean, the, 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 the position of the impact. So this will be, oops, this will be Jim coming from Wednesday mission. This will be a, uh, Peter in a different plane coming from a mission on that same day. This will be a, a, a gym the following day and on and on. And so as time was going by, you would keep accumulating the trace of bullets having impacted your fleet of planes. Now, usually when I give this uh, during a lecture, I make a pause and I ask, and what will you do with this information? And uh, uh, often enough, most I have a student brave enough to say, well, you will uh, overprotect the area that have been hit by more bullets, okay? And uh, if you were just thinking the same, don't, 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 don't feel ashamed. This is a natural way of thinking. And I actually, when, when, when given this example, I was also fooled. But the truth is that this is not how it works because you have to think back, why did the plane why can you see the bullet impact? Well, you can see the bullet impact because the plane came back, which means that if you'd never see a bullet impact, well, you have to account for why you don't see this bullet impact. And you have only two explanations. One explanation is that the enemies tried very hard not to hit the plane on that spot, thinking it was bringing bad luck or something. I think it's very unlikely. Or the other explanation is that whenever the plane was hit on that spot, it did not come back. And so if I look at that plane here on the wing, I don't know because there are few impacts around the wing. So I don't know, maybe the wing is not very exposed. But if I look at this spot here, it is suspiciously depleted of bullet impact. And I say suspiciously because I have a background. You see here, I have all these bullet impacts around. So I have no simple way of accounting for the depletion of bullet impact here. Or I have one way of accounting for this. And this way is to say, well, probably whenever, oops, whenever the plane was hit on that spot, it did not come back. And therefore, I have a depletion of bullet impact on that very spot, explaining that this is the only spot in the plane that I should strengthen. Okay. So now 
this is the most powerful image you can have of a multiple sequence alignment in which each sequence here is like one plane in the squadron. And this thing here is a suspiciously depleted, uh, a bullet impact depleted spot, you know, a spot that has received a suspiciously low number of impacts. While here, you'd have your normal background. Of course, depending on what you want to do with your multiple alignment, you're going to use these positions to discover active sites, to discover functional regions, or you're going to use these positions to reconstruct evolution. These positions are like neutral, they just accumulate impacts. You know, like uh, uh, if you're trying to look at, uh, to date a crater on the moon, you just count the number of impact that this crater has received. And this is telling you how old it is. So this can tell you how old it is, okay? So is it possible to do biology with very large multiple sequence alignment? This is a question we asked ourselves a long time ago with Fyodor Kondratchev, who was a, a colleague at the CRG. Fyodor is a very well-known evolutionary biologist. And for a long time, I had uh, explained that uh, it was impossible to do good biology with very large multiple sequence alignment. And I have to be honest, uh, the methods I developed do not scale very well, or at the time didn't scale very well. This has improved a lot since then. And so probably, you know, when, uh, when, you, when, 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 when your hammer is not very big, you, uh, you assume that all the nails are going to be tiny or something like this. So, uh, 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 but Fyodor convinced me that there was merits in uh, assembling very, very large multiple sequence alignments. And so for this paper, for this nature paper, which was really driven by him, we assembled what were at the time some of the largest multiple sequence alignment. This was very tedious. And we discovered that even if you give almost identical sequences, you know, these were very conserved sequences. These were uh, 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 orthologous, uh, uh, um, orthologous mitochondrial genes that tend to be very conserved. But even these highly conserved genes that you cool the line quite easily by hand with a lot of time in your hands, uh, uh, these were very difficult to properly align. And so that uh, uh, forced us, Miss Carsten, my student of the time, to develop a strategy based on Ticofi that would allow us to scale these things up. This was not a very effective strategy. We had to improve it a lot for the follow-up paper that I'll talk about at the end of uh, this seminar, but this was good enough to allow Fyodor to do an interesting modeling showing how much of a, of a breaking influence, you know, the, it's a slowing down evolution, how much slowing down of evolution was happening because of epistatic interaction. And it's interesting, you know, if you think about, this is uh, qualitatively, everybody knew about this. There was nothing revolutionary in, in this finding. No, what was revolutionary was having a method that would allow you to precisely quantify this phenomenon, you know, just like being able to quantify some of the constants of the universe, you know. This is, this is a constant, this is probably a constant of life. This is one of the lowest level constant of life one can measure. And because of the use of very large multiple sequence alignments, we were actually able to, to estimate this. Now, how big are big multiple sequence alignments? So right now, and I'll show you an example on this, the largest multiple sequence alignment that can be assembled is, uh, is an ABC transporter, is the ABC transporter family in PFAM, and we can go up to 1.5 million. That's the largest. Uh, it has been broken in smaller families now, so you have to patch these families together to get, again, the 1.5. That's the largest family we have, okay? And, of course, this is very important. This, uh, this as you know, uh, 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 behind everything that is happening in, uh, in, um, in, in tertiary structure prediction, there has been a crack. There has been the capacity to properly quantify the residue-residue interaction in three dimension. And that was, uh, that was something that everybody knew should be possible. There are very few people my age who did not want to study uh, protein structure prediction using coevolution because uh, this had worked so well on RNA, everybody was convinced it would work beautifully on proteins. And uh, for a long time, Alfonso Valencia had 
very nice results on the, on subtracting the evolutionary signal in order to figure out the protein protein interaction. But the problem was actually cracked by physicists that several, this is one of the papers, quite a few papers came out the same, roughly the same time, showing that if you do, if you manage to subtract various influences, sorry, I have uh, a little bit of background noise behind. I've uh, uh, <laughs> probably Amazon is circling around the house trying to deliver a, a parcel, but uh, don't worry. I hope this is not too problematic. Anyway, so these guys were actually uh, able to subtract this, and this relies on multiple sequence alignment. You need columns. You need nicely aligned column in order to be able to work out these things. And the improvements have been huge, you know. And this is a nice work by Desigins showing that if you improve the accuracy of your multiple sequence alignment, you actually improve quite significantly. The uh, you 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 can improve significantly the the accuracy of your prediction, the accuracy of the contact prediction. Yet we have more and more and more and more and more data. You know, this is this is happening very fast. Some of you may be aware of this, and I believe Monse. Uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, Roderick Vigo, uh, 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 Monse Coromina, who is talking, I think, in a few days. We we'll talk about it. They've been pushing very hard on this project. This is the Earth Biogenome Project. And so the aim of the Earth Biogenome Project is to sequence 1.5 million eukaryotic species. Well, that's huge. That's uh, And so every all the countries are now organizing, trying to have their own chapter. It's now very driven by the Chinese and by the Brits. but. Uh, the Catalans are also trying very hard. And so if you have 1.5 million animals, typically everybody has about 500 kinases. You know, that's one of the large protein families. So you're close to, uh, 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 I think it's 750 million sequences. And so seen from Sirius, this is 1 billion sequences. So we have to aim for multiple sequence alignment able to pack together 1 billion sequences. And why would we want to do this? Because this is knowledge. And in order to make the best out of our knowledge, we have to organize it. You know, if you have an alignment with 1 billion sequences, you have columns containing 1 billion residues. This will allow you to understand how for about 1 billion years, life has radiated on a protein family having similar functions. So you will understand how functions have evolved. You will understand how they may have interacting together across species. And this column, this column containing 1 billion residues is like the stratigraphy of everything that has happened. It's not really a stratigraphy because the columns you observe correspond to species all living at the same time. But and Rita was mentioning this because this is the image we took for our latest large scale multiple aligner. We said it's like a lens. It's like a lens that is allowing you to see very deep in the past. You know, when uh, uh, Hubble, as, as most of you probably know, the Hubble telescope is actually a time machine. Why? Because it allows us to see so far in the universe that we can look at things that have happened hundreds of millions of years ago. So it's a time machine. And these things here, these multiple alignments because of the underlying trees also are time machines. Time machines that allow us to reconstruct ancestral species that existed uh, hundreds and why not billion of years ago, provided you can collect all your information and pack it together in a multiple alignment. And you know, reconstructing these ancestral species is very important because, uh, as you know, it's not the first time our ecosystem is undergoing stress and challenges. This has happened many times in the past with massive extinctions. And we need to know, it will be very interesting to know what were the molecular consequences of these rough patches? How did adaptation take place after uh, 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 the Earth was hit by an asteroid or all these kind of things? We'd like to know. And in order to know this, we have to be able to bundle all of our information inside a giant model. Okay. Now, how are how good are multiple sequence alignment methods and how do they scale up? Before we do this, let's see how multiple aligners work. Okay. So in an ideal world, you know, this is this is your 
algorithm for aligning two sequences. We, we call it dynamic programming in biology. This is a bit abusive because dynamic programming uh, belongs to a very large class of algorithms. You know, whenever you use GPS, you use dynamic programming, this kind of thing. But you know, so what we call dynamic programming is actually the Needleman and Wunsch algorithm in biology, which was later recognized by the way to be dynamic programming. When Needleman and Wunsch published it, they didn't know it was dynamic programming, they reinvented it. Okay. And in an ideal world, if you can do this with two sequences, you can do this with three sequences, four sequences, and this becomes multi-dimensional dynamic programming with n sequences. Unfortunately, that's not how it works because making multiple sequence alignment of making multiple sequence alignment happens to be NP complete. And the reason is quite interesting. The reason is uh, well, I, I cannot give you a formal demonstration of NP completeness, which I'd be unable to do. I'm not, I'm not a computer scientist or a mathematician, but I can hand wave. And so the multiple sequence alignment is not a collection of optimal pairwise alignment. You know, while when you align two sequences, you get something optimal. When you align three sequences, you get uh, uh, A with B, A with C, B with C. These three pairwise alignments are not necessarily optimal. In order to get an optimal multiple alignment, you need to have most of the time a combination of suboptimal pairwise alignment. Of course, if your sequences are identical, this is easy. Everybody is optimal. But if your sequences are uh, uh, have a lower level of similarity, then most likely the pairwise projection of a given pair of sequence will be suboptimal. And that spells trouble because it means that suddenly your space of search is exploding. You will not be able to do an optimal multiple sequence line. How, and let me convince this, this is a student we, have, we had in our lab a few years ago. So if you align your sequences, you know, if you increase the number of dimensions the way you should do to reach optimality, let's say at the time it took one minute to align two globins, about 200 uh, amino acid on the computer. If you go for three globins, it's two hours, so you can see here a happy student, you know, two hours of work and you're done and you know you've done a little bit of something, but what? But then this guy was ambitious, the student was ambitious, and so this student went for the four globin problem, which is 10 days computation. That's what students look like when they've been gazing at a screen for, for 10 days. Uh, uh, then uh, that student, you know, was so interested in globin that uh, the student went for the three years for, for, for the five globins, which is a PhD. It's not the best, the most interesting PhD, but why not? This was not a student from Bologna, don't worry. And uh, I understand that this student is now interested in the six globin problem. It is, let's say, a long postdoc, a very long postdoc. You could go for the seven globin problem, which would be 30,000 years, or you could even go for the three, eight globins problem, okay? And given, uh, given the situation on our planet now, I cannot claim that uh, carbon-based life will still be a thing in, in three million years, eh? but assuming it is, you know, eight globins. Now, you see me, I have aligned thousands of globins, and I'm not that old, you know, and I, I'm not young, but I'm not as old as you may think I am. So how did I do it? Well, I used a heuristic algorithm, and I used a heuristic algorithm, which is even worse than this. It's a greedy algorithm. It is the, the, the cluster W. So cluster W is not, is not the, uh, 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 the, the algorithm was described a little bit earlier. Now that's an interesting story. For many years, we cited as, uh, as, uh, as the original uh, author of this, uh, either uh, 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 Doolittle or uh, Taylor, you know, who described, who published close by in 1989, the progressive algorithm. But as it turns out, it was rediscovered not so long ago that the person who actually published the first description of the progressive algorithm was Paula Hogewe, who is a, a Dutch scientist. I think she recently retired. And so this is by Paula Hogewe. So cluster W, it's a greedy heuristic meaning that it gives you no warranty. What is a greedy heuristic? Let me give you a very simple example. Uh, um, let's say you go to the cafeteria and uh, you arrive at the cafeteria and there are no forks and uh, no plates. You know, there was, uh, there was a strike or maybe because of the rules of distanciation, whatever, you're not allowed to actually, I'm talking about cafeteria. I believe that uh, if things keep going the way they go, 
in a, in a couple of years, I will have to explain to the students what cafeterias were, but you know, we still remember. And so you arrive to the cafeteria and oh, well, you're very hungry and you have no fork, you have no plate. So what are you gonna do? Well, well, you know, you move and you see potatoes and you're very hungry. So you stuff yourself with potatoes. Ah, you're not hungry anymore. And you keep moving. You're not allowed to look ahead. Eh? You're only allowed to go once. And suddenly what do you have in front of you? You have lobster and caviar and, but you're not hungry anymore. You, 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 you stuff yourself with potatoes. And that's a greedy algorithm. That's an algorithm that is doing as good as it can where it is without making any provision for the future. And so a greedy algorithm is not going to guarantee optimality. In, in, in the case of the meal I was just describing, optimality will have been me eating lobster and caviar and all these things. But no, this is not what it is going to do for you. But it is going to guarantee a reasonable outcome. And in that case, you know, you know, I've had a lot of potatoes. I'm not hungry anymore. I can go back to work. So it's good. It's very, very fast. And so how does it work? <clears throat> so this is the original paper I was mentioning by Paula Hogewitz. So usually if there is a Dutch in the in the audience, they raise their hand and say, no, it's a hog or hog or something that I can unfortunately not pronounce correctly. That's that that's a name. And so the idea is that rather than aligning sequences, you're going to start clustering them. This clustering looks like a phylogenetic tree. In fact, you can use phylogenetic tree reconstruction methods to do this, but this thing is not a phylogenetic tree. It's very important. It's still highly debated in the field, and there are indications that what we actually call a, 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 a um, what we actually call a phylogenetic tree is not necessarily the best guide tree, but there, there is a lot of debate on this, and I won't have much time to discuss it. But if you look at the literature, you will see that strange guide trees that are clearly phylogenetically <coughs> inaccurate can give uh, very accurate uh, uh, alignments. And I'll give you just one example. Let's imagine this is uh, we don't have the tree here. But let's imagine you have mouse, human, and cow. The correct phylogenetic tree is going to put human and mouse together. You know, mice are just little human, a little bit, and the cow is quite far. But as it happens, because of the very fast generation time of, uh, of, uh, of rodents, they evolve faster. And so they will typically have a long branch. And it can be challenging, actually, to align mouse and human while it's usually much easier to align mouse and cow. And so for this reason, your guide tree may yield a better alignment if it is slightly phylogenetically inaccurate, okay? But there is quite still <coughs> quite a lot of dispute on these things. And, and uh, it is an ongoing uh, topic of research. What is also an ongoing topic of research is a scaling up of this clustering. This clustering is a limiting factor. It's difficult to cluster millions of sequences. Uh, it's difficult to do this accurately without doing an all against all comparison. And when you have million all against all spells trouble, you know, it's quadratic, it's a big, it's a big issue. So what? So how does it work? What is the trick? Well, you know, rather than aligning all of my sequences at once, I'm simply going to align these blue sequences here. I apologize if anybody is colorblind. So the sequences, they have the same color. So they get aligned together. You do this uh, with dynamic programming. It got a little bit ugly here. I don't know why, but you do this in, yeah, this slide got a little bit, anyway. You do this in, in dynamic programming and that's going to take one minute. Then you do the other one, which is going to take one minute as well. And then, and that's a trick, rather than realigning the full sequences, so this thing here should be, let me just see if I can quickly, oops, yeah, move this thing here. No, I cannot, oops, that's good. Uh, well, it doesn't really matter. That's not the right time to, no, <laughs> that's the mess. Okay, so uh, I think it's because I changed the, I went to 16, 19, so I, I changed the, the ratio, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, so this was supposed to be in front of the gap, and so here, you have aligned your sequences in, uh, in quadratic time, one minute. Here you have aligned the sequences in quadratic time. And now, rather than making a four-way alignment, you are going to align your two intermediate alignments. Here they are. And that you can do in one minute, you know, a little bit more of this is a bit longer, but not so much more than one minute. And the trick is, uh, if you want to think simple thing that this alignment is turned into a consensus sequence. And that alignment here is turned into another consensus sequence, which means that at that stage, 
you're only aligning two sequences. So one plus one plus one, three minutes. Something that if you remember the example I gave before was supposed to last 10 days, no, was supposed to last two hours is now done in three minutes. And if you go for the seven bobbin alignments, the one that was supposed to last for uh, uh, three million years, you're gonna do it in six minutes, okay? Now, uh, when you do in six minutes, something that is supposed to last three million years in order to guarantee the solution, you know that you're buying a Rolex for uh, five euros, you know, on the Ramblas in Barcelona when, uh, in the time when we still had tourists. And so you know that something is probably wrong with this Rolex, you know, either it's stolen or most likely it's not a Rolex at all. And that's what happens here. You know, we have taken shortcuts and where is the shortcut? You see here, when you set the gap here, you may not have a lot of signal to set the gap. And that alignment here, that pairwise alignment is in any way going to be optimal between these two sequences. And if you remember what I said before, the final optimal alignment is almost never going to be a combination of optimal pairwise alignment. So by just optimally aligning the sequence, you know that you have ruined your chance to reach optimality, but you have reasonable chances to arrive at something usable. And to give you a precise example, you know, if you've put the gap that is here, here, because of the information in the blue sequences, it may be that the information in the orange sequences would have shifted this gap a little bit, and that these gaps would have been aligned because they were maybe evolutionary, the same thing. But you cannot do this. You cannot look ahead, you know, you're like in the cafeteria, you're not allowed to look one step ahead. And as a consequence, you may have a suboptimal alignment, okay? Now, the progressive alignment is just a canvas. There are many, many, many variations. And in fact, a few years ago with a student of mine, with uh, Maria Chatsu, she's uh, should appear here, uh, uh, we wrote this review for briefings in bioinformatics where we played, you know, this, uh, 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 by clustering game. And so we recorded all the specificities of all these algorithms. And we, uh, um, and we, uh, we, we recorded all the specificity of these algorithms and we kind of clustered them and all these things. And well, so all of, most of these things use guide tree, but not all of them. Uh, 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 um, most of these things, uh, uh, some of these things use per HMM, some of these things use consistency, like typically, this class of algorithms and on and on. So you have a lot of recipes. So all of these things are progressive aligners, you know, the, 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 there used to be a time when there were a lot of aligners that were not progressive aligners, but now everybody kind of agree that this is the only way to scale. This has to be progressive somehow, okay? Now, how accurate are these things? Well, uh, how, do you how can you tell how accurate they are? You need a standard of truth. And so what is the standard of truth? In this case, the standard of truth happens to be a structure-based reference alignment. You have a bunch of sequences for which you know the experimental structure and, and soon the predicted structure, actually, this is going to have a huge impact, but I, I, I'll talk about this some other day, maybe. So you have a, you're gonna have a structure-based reference alignment, that is an alignment of your sequences, not based on the sequences, but based on the structural information contained in the sequences. There is a debate in the community if these are good standard of truth to infer phylogenetic trees. The fact and the matter is that the information contained in the structure is so strong and so dense that even though it's NP complete to align even a pair of structure, the alignments happen to be very, very informative. You know, the active sites are always aligned the way they should. So these alignments are very good. Biologically speaking, the structure-based alignment always make a lot of sense. And so what you're gonna do is that you're gonna ask, am I able to recapitulate my structure-based alignment by simply aligning the sequences? And the most commonly used uh, measure is the sum of pair, the sub. You can go column by column as well, but uh, you can either go pair of residues or column by column. And so here I have residue number five and seven aligned together in my target alignment. And they're also aligned in the structure based alignment. That's one. Then I look at the other pair here and you can see here that uh, 
here I have in the target alignment, I have nine and eight aligned together. I look at this and not aligned together. So that's a no. Here I get a zero. Okay. And I'm simply going to count across my target alignment, the sequence based alignment I'm trying to evaluate, how many pairs of residues are aligned the same way as they are aligned in the structure based reference alignment. The higher the score, the more accurate I will consider my sequence aligner to be. Okay. And uh, uh, we have plenty of reference data sets. We have at least five collections of structure based reference alignments that are used for multiple sequence alignment benchmarking. Okay. And so this one is something I did a few years ago. So we took uh, all of these aligners. And this one is interesting. This was Prank. This had just been published in Science. And Prank is supposed to be an evolutionarily correct aligner. And Prank was actually validated on uh, 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 phylogenetic simulation. And that opened a big debate in the community as to whether uh, 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 there was a rift between structure based, uh, structurally correct alignment, protein alignment, and phylogenetic correct alignment or not. This debate is still unresolved. It's still, uh, it's still something that people are discussing. Some people are arguing that structure, structurally correct alignment and evolutionary correct alignment do not have to be the same thing. And there are sound arguments for this. A, a, a structure is evolving under constraints, so it may not reflect very well the, 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 the diffusion. Uh, um, on the other hand, uh, uh, other people are arguing that the two things are so close to one another that uh, uh, it will be crazy not to use structural information to infer evolutionary uh, reconstruction. And so this thing is still debated. But, uh, uh, and so if you go along this, these kind of things here are the consistency based aligner. And as you can see, the consistency based aligner were about 10 points. You know, these are the sum of pair. The colon is a sum of pair. They were about 10 points better. These ones, oops. These ones here are interesting. These are the uh, 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 homology extended alignment. So these are alignments where aligners that use consistency, but rather than aligning sequences, they run a blast for every sequence and they turn this blast into a profile and they make a multiple profile alignment. So these are significantly more accurate. So it's like uh, uh, using a multiple sequence alignment instead of a substitution matrix, okay? It's very slow. It says it's really the state of the art and I'll show you something else. And then these guys here are the structure base. And so here it's a little bit tricky because you're comparing structure-based alignment with structure-based alignment. So effectively, you're just looking at the consistency across structural aligners, okay? Now, uh, 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 there is a rule, and, and the rule number one is never believe the benchmark by the authors themselves. So I've just shown you my own benchmark. Don't believe it because, uh, and you know, I, I, I like to think I'm a honest scientist and, uh, and, uh, uh, and I read uh, Richard Feynman and I read the Cargo Cult and I read everything and I try very hard to be, to be my own enemy as far as science is concerned, but it's not enough and it will never be enough. This is full of unconscious bias. It's very, very difficult not to be on the side of your method. You know, this, this is a natural human trait. You've spent so much time trying to make these methods as good as possible. You're not gonna, you're not gonna be as rough as you should be when you start fighting your own method. You have to trust your competitors for this. And so you should only look at the benchmarks made by your competitors. They are the only uh, trustable benchmarks. And so I was very happy to see this. So Tendi Wan now is more of an evolutionary biologist, but she's gone into a, a multiple sequence alignment for quite some time. She's been highly successful. So I would say she's uh, probably uh, the, the highest uh, profile competitor I have in this field. And when I say competitor, you know, I, I, I mean it in a, in a respectful way. This is it's a, it's a very you know it's a small community so it's a very cooperative but yet you know with uh, with friendly competition and so they did show something that was I was very excited so these are if you go back here this method here the one that we're using the profile extension so they were able to show that these methods so promals and Ticofi using this is called psychofi in this context were actually significantly more accurate than the rest and. They found this quite consistent. So this is Ticofi. They find this quite consistently across a wide range of alternative uh, uh, structure-based reference alignments. 
Unfortunately, these are tiny alignments, you know, with at most 25 sequences. But that's a very important milestone for us because it shows that our original hypothesis on psychophy was actually correct. There is a side story on this, which is quite interesting. So I, um, I, I, I implemented uh, I implemented psychophy quite early. I implemented psychophy almost uh, the year I implemented psychophy, and I think this was ninety nine. And at the time, uh, I had the possibility to use the BLAST server, you know, to, to programmatically use the BLAST server of the Swiss Bioinformatics Institute. So it was a lot of CPU, so I could do a lot of stuff. And I was overexcited with this because I thought with the profiles, my alignments are going to be amazing. And so I run everything. It took something like two or three months to run. This was very slow. And when the results came, you know, kind of hitchhiker guide to the galaxy stuff, that was not so good. I was very disappointed. And so I let it. I let it rot. And uh, a couple of years later, I received to review the promos paper. And promos was very nice. This was uh, this is uh, this was a nice uh, reimplementation of the of the of the of the propcons paper. You know, using rather than uh, doing the pairwise alignment with Needleman and Wunsch and Smith and Waterman, they were doing the, the for the consistency. They were using HMN, which was a very smart idea. And they were also implementing the profile extension. And to my surprise, their results was, were amazing. So I was very pissed off. And I thought, shit, I probably, uh, this is recorded, I, uh, language. Oh, damn, I, I, I should, uh, I probably made the bug in my implementation. And I went back to my implementation, which was running fine. And so I rerun it. It took about a couple of weeks this time. And it gave results that were very comparable to the results of Promos. And what I changed, the databases. The databases had become denser. And because they had become denser, it was now possible to infer evolutionary relationship, pairwise alignments that were impossible to infer before. Okay. And interestingly, this is one of the driving force behind protein structure 3D predictions. One of the things, two things have improved. On one side, the algorithms, we discussed it a bit, and you had even much more background with David Jones. But on the other side, what also has improved dramatically is the density of databases. With denser databases, we can do more uh, meaningful models. Now, in theory, the progressive framework should work like a charm on very large data set. This is the expectation. This is what everybody is expecting. And we're going to see. I, uh, uh, just to clarify, I, I, I have until one, no? Uh, 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 Gigi? Maybe he's not online now. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I, I'll be a bit shorter, right? Because two hours is, is too long for everybody and then and, and people may collapse. But uh, uh, Don't worry. I, was, <laughs> I was just, because I'm going over the hour and I was just checking. Okay, so in theory, the progressive framework should work like a chunk. My, my dog thinks it's, it's, it has been too long already and he's complaining. So in theory, the progressive uh, framework should work like a charm on very large data set. You know, you'd think the more sequences, the denser it's going to be, the tree is going to be very dense. We're going to get amazing stuff. Is this the case? That's what people thought. But there is this nice work by, uh, by, by, uh, by Kato, who is the author behind MAFT, which is one of the very good aligner. And that was in 2005. And they did something very small. They took the existing database and they flushed in extra sequences. And you can see, this is the accuracy. In most of the cases, you start with, with, your, with a few sequences, with the structure you have, you get 35% accuracy on these sequences. You add 20 intermediate homologue, you get 45. And, and, and that trend seems to happen everywhere. On, on all the aligners, if you had a few sequences, a few intermediate sequences, you get more accurate alignments. So the expectation was simple. It's just a matter of time. When we get more sequences, we'll have to make the algorithms a bit more efficient, but we can skip the paradigm and the accuracy is going to increase. And then, bada boom, Des Higgins in the cluster Omega paper did show exactly the other way around. What they did show is that when you keep increasing the number of sequences, we'll come back to how they measure accuracy. But basically, it's the same idea, right? We don't have so many structures, but even with a small number of structures, you can embed them in very large data set and you can use, still use this structure. It's a kind of spiking process. You know, you have 20 structures within 100,000 sequences and the relative alignment of these structures 
reflects the alignment of the big data set. So what they were able to show is that you start with 100 sequences and you keep increasing the number of sequences and accuracy actually increased, as you would expect. And then suddenly, in their system, over 1,000 sequences, accuracy starts decreasing. Oof. And uh, that's not what you expect. You know, you'd expect accuracy at worst to remain stable or at best to keep increasing till you reach a maximum. It's a complicated thing to measure. And this, uh, this uh, titration uh, has a few problems because uh, colon by colon, this is not exactly the same family. We've been playing with this and we've been showing that even within the same family by controlling the amount of information you keep adding, this trend remains. That is, you have a peak and then when you keep adding homologous sequences, it starts decreasing. More data, therefore, not only means more computation, which is something everybody was expecting, it also means less accurate models. And here we have a problem. We really have a problem because uh, this challenges everything we are doing. You know, Everything we are doing these days in science relies on the idea that more data is good. And what I'm telling you here is that more data is not good for you. More data is harmful for the way you infer your biology. So we have an issue. Which means that solution number one, buy twice more computer every year, forget about it. Anyway, this was off the table since the beginning. The solution number two, efficient algorithmic scale up, forget about it. This is not enough because the algorithms do not work. You know, Even if you scale up the algorithm, the model accuracy are going to decrease. So you need more computers and you need better algorithms. And these are two challenges, right? Now, yeah, I once read that this was a critique about uh, one uh, about uh, Irving Welsh. Irving Welsh wrote uh, Train Spotter. If some of you, you know, this was a movie of my generation, one of the most uh, very funny, but one of the most depressing movie you've, you've ever seen. And uh, one critic wrote about uh, Irving Welsh. In, in Irving Welsh's world, things are never so bad that they cannot get worse. And, and, and that's exactly what the, one of the vision, one of the take I have of biology, you know, whenever you do this kind of thing, things are never so bad, they cannot become even worse. And now I'm gonna spend a bit of time unsettling you even more about stability. As it turns out, the models on which so much of our biology relies happen to be relatively unstable. So what do I mean by stability? Let's say you have this bunch of sequences you want to align. If method one is giving you this alignment and method two is giving you that alignment, X being another column, you know, coming up there, just carved three columns, then you have something that isn't stable. This is the same data, two methods, two methods are giving you two things that are different. So, it is well known that MSAs are unstable across methods, and that has been established. I, I, I apologize, just two minutes. I, have, I think I locked my wife out. <laughs> just a second. Don't worry. Oops. I'm back. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Don't I, worry. <laughs> there was a, was a no. Anyway, so this is well known instability. This is a, a nice work by Sushar in, uh, in Science in 2001. And they did show that you take the same data set, you align it with six aligner, you're going to get six different phylogenetic trees. Not all the time, but often enough. And that shouldn't be the case. No, it's a very clean analysis because. There is no underlying hypothesis. It doesn't matter if they took the orthologs or not. These should be the same trees. This is the same data. This should be the same trees. And this is actually not what is going to happen here. And so what? Uh, uh, that was not so surprising. It was nice that they did it. It was nice that they quantified it. But everybody working on multiple sequence alignments knew about this. But we uncovered something even weirder than that. We uncover the fact that when we realign the sequences, changing the input order with the same method, you get a similar effect. And now this is big because normally 
even if you change the input order of the sequences, you should get the same guide tree. And you actually get topologically similar guide trees. And that should not have a huge effect on the alignment, but it does. It is something that people have known for a long time. Uh, uh, um, for instance, in Tikofi, we cheat. We, we sort the sequences alphabetically and then by length and all these kind of things so that the input remains stable. But that's that's artificial. You know, this sorting is totally arbitrary. And, and, and so the fact is that if you change the input order of your sequences, you get different alignment. And that is a huge effect on very large alignment. On very large alignment, this is something we did with, uh, with my student, Maria Shetsu, uh, quite some time ago. Uh, and with uh, Olivier Gasquel, with very large alignment, almost 50% of the columns are going to be affected when you start shuffling the order of your input sequences. That's a lot. If you think that a column is a reflection of the history, the evolutionary history of your sequences, 50% of your columns are going to be non-trustable because you have no reason to believe one column of one replicate over another column of another replicate, okay? And so what you can see here is that the sequences with a low level of identity are especially sensitive to this process. On the sequences with a low level of identity, you go down to 45%, more than half of your columns are actually affected. And does this have an impact on the underlying phylogenetic tree? And the short answer is yes, it has. How do we compare phylogenetic trees? We use something that is called Robinson and Foles. So how does it work? It's very simple. In a tree, every node is actually a split. It's a split between the sequences on the left and the sequences, sorry, the sequences on the left. So the sequences that are going to be here, all of these guys, it's a split between A, N, O, M, L and H, K, G, I, okay? So this split, I can go here. Do I have it? L, M, N, O, no, I don't have it. So this split will, uh, oh yeah, yes, I have it. I have it, L, M, N, O, L, M, N, O. Yes, I have it because A is here on the other side. So you see that split here is present in both trees and that split here, H, I, well, no, that split here is not present in that form, okay? H, I versus all the rest of the sequences. So Robinson and Fowles simply counts the number of splits that are common between your reference tree, between the two trees you are trying to compare. Okay, that's one, that's one of the many ways of comparing trees. There are other ways that are a little bit more statistical, but Robinson and Foles is, is very often used. And what we found is that the trees estimated from the alignments that were unstable turned out to be equally unstable. What it means is that you take your sequences, you shuffle them, you get an alignment, you make a tree, you reshuffle the sequences, get another alignment, get another tree, and then you compare the two trees or the entries you have. And what you can see is that when the number of sequences increases, the stability of the tree decreases significantly uh, by about a third. Okay, so uh, um, why why is this? Why are the uh, uh, multiple sequence alignment unstable? Well. When working on that stuff, we, we uncover the reason, and the reason is actually pretty trivial and pretty interesting. All of these alignments are based on a progressive assembly of the sequences, okay, following the guide tree, what I was showing. And so the guide tree is typically a binary tree yeah, in all of these implementations. It, it, it does not always have to be, but in practice, it's always a, a, a binary tree. And so this is the new format, if some of you are familiar with. So if this is my tree, I'm going to write it this way, A and B in parentheses, and then connect it to the node C, parentheses, and like this. I can have uh, multifurcated trees if I want, but uh, and I can have binary trees. And what is very important here is to realize that there is an intrinsic ambiguity here. The nodes are not older. A and B are actually not ordered. These two new weak trees are topologically identical. If you run Robinson and Falls between this and this, you're gonna get a score of zero, meaning no difference. But from a multiple sequence alignment point of view, there is a difference and let me explain. You see, if you use 
the left guide tree, you're going to align the blue sequence with the green sequence and the red sequence, for instance, with the orange sequence. I apologize if some of you have problems in these shades. If you change inside new week, the order, you may start with the green versus the blue. So you see blue versus green and green versus blue. You don't tell me that this is the same. You know, these are two sequences, you align them. That's not quite the same. And that has to do with, uh, with a process that is known as high road, low road in dynamic programming. So let me show you just the result of this. So this is me playing with the order ACBD. So all of these trees, these four trees are topologically identical. You know, you run Robinson and Falls between them. They're the same thing. But <clears throat> if you use them as guide tree to build your alignment, you're gonna get all these alignments. And you're gonna get, you see, there is quite a lot of variability. There is one, this one and this one are different. And this one and this one are, so uh, 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 all of these alignments, you get four different alignments in that case. It's quite remarkable. So why is that? So it's because when you align two sequences, the score, the, the pairwise alignment is always going to be optimal. It's only going to deliver an alignment that has an optimal score, but you may have alternative optimal alignments, alternative pairwise optimal alignments. And let me show you this very simple example, which will convince you these two alignments, they're equally optimal. They have the same score, but they are different. And they are different because the sequences have been aligned in a different order. And that goes back to dynamic programming. In dynamic programming, you are going to fill up your dynamic, the optimal alignment of your sequences by always figuring out the best of these three values. Okay. When you have a tie, when this thing, you know, gap in the top sequence, gap in the bottom sequence, substitution in the central sequence, when these three things are identical, you have to take a decision. This decision has no implication on the optimality. It will still deliver an optimal alignment. But you have to take a decision. In most implementations, these decisions is arbitrary. It's uh, 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 insertion first, then gap in the top sequence and gap in the bottom sequence, or other arbitrary ways of breaking your time. They can be arbitrary because this has no influence on optimality. But because it's arbitrary, it means that changing the order of your sequence will actually change the alignment. We call this high road, low road. You know, if you decide, for instance, to favor insertion, all things being equal, if you favor insertion in the top sequence, it means that if you invert the order of your sequences, the insertion will now be in sequence B rather than in sequence A and all this. So that is a major source of instability. And this is what we uncovered in these days. And so we played a very funny game. We, uh, rather than shuffling the order of the sequences, we shuffled the order of the taxa in the guide tree, but we shuffled it in a way that was topologically constant, meaning, you know, A shuffled with B, A, B shuffled with C, D, you know, all this shuffling that is not changing the topology of the tree, but changing the inner ordering of the nodes. And as you can see, we were able to recapitulate a large part. So these shuffled guide trees were about as is stable, not, not as much, only partly, but almost as instable, they were recapitulating two thirds of the instability that was occasionated by shuffling the input of the sequence order, okay? So that was a very exciting result. And we have, uh, I'll show you in a few minutes that we have implemented this in a, in a generalized bootstrap that does not only take into account evolutionary diffusion, but also takes into account uh, uh, um, also takes into account um, uh, 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 this uh, 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 alignment instability. Okay. Now, one question you may ask, and I will uh, 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 slowly finish on this. One question you may ask is, why are large progressive multiple alignments so bad? Why are things decreasing above one thousand sequences? We can only hand wave on these things, but there are quite. Uh, a few uh, convincing um, uh, uh, candidates. The aligners are based on profile profile alignments and the large profiles contain mostly gaps. If you look at very large alignments, 
it's amazing you know if you look at them on, on your screen you only see gaps and every once in a while you see a you see a residue here and there just like uh, you know uh, meat, meat, meatballs in spaghetti in a very very cheap non-italian restaurant this kind of thing so very very few and this means that in very very large colon mutual information is almost lost and when you try to combine these very very large profiles it's very understandable that sequence alignment accuracy will be very low okay so uh, uh, there is something else that, that is very important to realize let's say that this is my profile this is a very large profile and so here just by eye just eyeballing you can tell <coughs> that you have a very nice mutual information you have x and y and whenever x is turned into y y is turning into x here so you have something mutual and on rna you know this has been very important to infer what's on in creek uh, base pair but on, on this uh, sequence alignment it is something quite visible if i turn this into a profile my profiler is going to say that this sequence here is probably a member of the family the profile will be right and so we live for this one but it's going it's also going to recognize this sequence here as a highly probable member of the family and we'll draw the same conclusion on that sequence that's not true i've never seen y and y at this position this is something we've never seen or x and x the profile is intrinsically unable to take into account the core variation associated with our sequences and there's nothing we can do about this we could if we were using much more complicated uh, profiling tools like stochastic context-free grammar and this kind of things used for RNA. But for proteins, we don't know how to, how to solve this problem, okay? Profiles do not care about covariation. Uh, um, another problem is that uh, ambiguous tie breaking can break the MSA, you know? The fact that the way you break your tie on the top and the way you break your tie on the bottom, you know, what I was showing before is non coordinated in a progressive alignment means that you're going to break your alignment and here i'm giving you this very simple example you know i have an ambiguity here and i have an ambiguity here what is here and what is there i don't know these are large sequences but on this precise point if i had the capacity to have these sequences talking with these sequences then i will break the tie in a way that will be consistent I don't know which one is the most accurate and somehow I don't have enough information to decide. The only thing I should make sure is that in order to reach optimality, whatever arbitrary decision I take on the top, I should take on the bottom. But that's not the way it works. And as a consequence, I have an alignment that makes it look as if I had a complex indel pattern, which is probably not the case. Uh, we came up with this when working on the first data set with Fyodor Kondratov in the Nature paper, because when you have this very, very large, almost identical alignment, every once in a while you see internal duplications. And these internal duplications are totally artifactual. They actually relate to the kind of thing I'm showing you here. To make things worse, these things get much worse as more sequences get added because you get these very, very distant decisions that are being taken. And of course, if your tree, you know, this is quite enhanced whenever your tree is not accurate, when these sequences should be close together in the tree, but they turn out to be a bit too far apart, then this is going to make things even worse. Okay. So, what are the potential fix? For the gaps, we should try to avoid aligning large data sets. We should compose the multiple sequence alignment from smaller multiple sequence alignment. For the flattening, the missing of the mutual information, we should avoid profile to profile in, in alignments. And as you can tell, these two things seem to be working against one another. You know, if we have to compose the multiple sequence alignment from smaller multiple sequence alignment, how are we going to avoid doing profile profile alignment? Well, there's a trick and I'll show you in a minute. Oops, 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 oops. And uh, uh, the ties, we should avoid early decision. We should synchronize the most distantly related sequences as early as possible in the process. And that's exactly the opposite of what the progressive alignment does. In the progressive alignment, the very distantly related sequences only meet by the end of the alignment process when all the decisions have already been taken, all the low-level decisions. 
And that brought us to something that we, uh, we ironically named the regressive algorithm. It's a little bit unfair because it's still a progressive alignment, but because it works in a way that is intuitively opposite to, or, or some component of this are opposite to the uh, progressive algorithm, we named it the regressive algorithm. Okay, so how does it work? The first thing is that like everybody, we start with a guide tree. There is no alternative, you know, you need a guide tree. Where does this guide tree come from? There are quite a few methods that are doing large scale guide tree. They're not very good, they're very slow. And that's clearly an area that will remain a focus of intense research work, getting high quality guide trees. Uh, the, the people do not necessarily agree on this, but I, I strongly believe that the secret of the correct alignment lies in the guide tree. Now, here uh, uh, for this example, I have done something a little bit weird. I have named the sequences by their length. So this sequence is two residue long, this sequence is one residue long, this sequence is six long. And as you can see here, every length is unique. Okay, it's just a trick for the example. This is going to make things simpler. I'm now going to go along the tree and I'm going to record the name of the most informative sequence on every node. So for instance, on this node here, this node has two children. What is the most informative sequence? You can define the most informative sequence in many ways that, are comp that can be computationally very expensive. It turned out that after many trials and errors, we found out that the most informative metric is the length. The longest sequence is the most informative. Okay. And so here, sequence number two is the most informative. Sequence number six is the most informative, five and so on. And so we're gonna label every node here with the name of the longest sequence, which happens to be the length of that sequence in this specific example. So here, sequence two, six, and we're gonna go on and on and on like this till we reach here. So 14, is the longest sequence of the whole data set and therefore the most informative. 11 is the longest sequence of that subtree and 14 is the longest sequence of that subtree, okay? And now you can tell intuitively, if I were to collect 11 and 14, I'd have the best summary of my data set given two sequences. I would have the subset of two sequences that best capture all the information contained in my entire alignment. And that's exactly how the algorithm is going to work. The algorithm is going to collect n representative sequences starting from the root. And so it does this depth by depth. Let me explain. I start at 14, okay? And I have decided that I wanted to collect three sequences. So at 14, I, uh, 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 I will uh, expand my node with these two children, and I will now have two sequences, 11 and 14. Two is smaller than three, which means that I need to keep expanding my nodes. And so I am going to expand now the node 11 and it gets expanded into six and 11. So now I have six, 11 and 14. That's three sequences and I wanted to have three sequences. So I have my first multiple alignment data set. If n had been equal to four, I would have expanded 14 into 13 and 14. If n had been equal to five, I would have expanded 14 and 10. And then I would also have expanded this one to get at least five sequences, okay? But n being equal to three, I expand this thing. And so what do I have here? I have a multiple alignment of the n of the three most informative sequences. I have the most informative, sorry, alignment of three sequences I can get <laughs> given all of my sequences and given the criteria I have for information content, okay? Now this is cool because it will allow me to synchronize the most distantly related sequences with respect to arbitrary gap insertion, you know? So all of these things are now synchronized. Of course, this can be tricky because the sequences can be a little bit harder to align because they are more distantly related. Okay, but we'll come back to this. Now, I will keep applying my algorithm on every node. So every node here becomes a parent. And so I will expand this node once. This gives two and six. Then I expand it two and six are smaller. So two, sorry, 
two sequences, two and six, that's two sequences, that's smaller than three. I have to do one more expansion and here the same. And here I have three sequences, that's done. And then the next step, I'm going to keep expanding, but because I've reached the end, you know, if you have a node that happens to be a leaf, you cannot expand it further. And some of these terminal alignments are going to be a little bit smaller than N because they are terminal. So what do I have now? I have a collection of small alignments. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I have nine alignments, nine multiple alignments. Well, these ones are small multiple alignments because they're pairwise multiple alignments, but they could be multiple. I have a collection of multiple alignments that can all be computed independently. So the fact that they can be computed independently is great because it means that I can use whatever supercomputer I have access to. And the fact that they are small, that they contain a small number of sequences is also good because the complexity that is the time it takes to compute a multiple sequence alignment is not linear. You know, it's usually more than linear, meaning that if you're, if you do, if you compute the alignment of six sequences, this is going to be more time than computing three plus three, you know, six may take 10 minutes while three may take one minute, for instance, something like this. So three plus three, this is going to be two minutes while six is going to take 10 minutes. Okay. So computing, breaking your problem in smaller alignments is a good idea in terms of complexity. Uh, that had been done for a long time, but what had been done so far was to break down things lower. And it is the first time here that we show that consistently aligning the most distantly related sequences first is a good idea with respect to the final accuracy. So that is great is that any multiple aligner can do, and that is going to be very important for the validation because the fact that we can use here any multiple aligner means that we are going to be able to compare the progressive use of a guide tree versus the regressive use of a guide tree. Everything is identical. It's just the way we interpret the guide tree that changes between the progressive and the regressive algorithm. Okay. So uh, uh, how do we finish? How do we produce the final alignment? There's a trick here. So this is the parent alignment. This is the first of all. Yeah? And you can see the parent alignment has one sequence in common with each of its children. Okay. Which means that if I have this parent alignment and this child alignment, I can combine these two sub alignment without having to recompute anything by just matching the columns. You know, here I have residue I sequence six in the parent alignment. And here I have residue I of sequence six in the child alignment. Therefore, when I'm going to merge this alignment, I do not have to compute an alignment. I do not have to make a profile profile alignment. I simply have to collect these pointers and to merge them, to merge that column with that column via the common pointer. Whenever I have a gap, I have to insert these gaps here because they have to be, you know, they are implicit, you know, between I and J, if I have gaps here and no gap here, I have to insert. <clears throat> when you have gaps between the same residues, these gaps were independently acquired and they have to be concatenated. They cannot be aligned. That's a part of the algorithm we are still working on. And it seems we can do a little bit better than simply stacking the gaps, which tends to expand the alignments a little bit. Okay. So, how does this work? We have, we can use any third party guide tree method. We can use any third party guide tree aligner. And we are very fast because the merging of the small alignment is simply proportional to the sequence length. And this is even better because we don't need to store the gaps in memory. We can store only the small alignments and the number of gaps you need to insert when you combine the small alignments. And then that gets written onto the disk, but till you write in the disk, the gaps do not have to be stored in memory. So that's a very efficient algorithm in terms of memory. The memory, memory footprint is very tiny because of this, okay? So of course, this is, these are plenty of nice ideas and this is me crazy and then saying, oh, this is, and we do this and we do that. 
but the bottom line is always the same. Does it work? And that's what you do with your, with your benchmarking. So how are we going to know it works? You remember I told you about these uh, structure-based reference alignments, but uh, you know we are looking at thousands of sequences here and we do not have any family with thousands of uh, structures. So the idea which was uh, pioneered by, uh, by Des Higgins um, quite some time ago now is to, uh, in the Clostal O paper, is to embed sequences, to take a bunch of structures and you embed them within the data set, okay? And then you simply look at the accuracy, you know, you extract the structures from the big alignment and you're going to evaluate your accuracy with respect to the structures embedded in the alignment. There are plenty of small issues with this protocol, but it's a reasonable proxy and it gives us a chance to, to compare alternative ways of uh, aligning the sequences. Now, uh, 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 so what I was telling you, and this is by far the most interesting figure in the paper, because uh, first of all, very honestly, I was expecting the regressive algorithm to be fast, and that was the original intention, but I was expecting it to be a little bit less accurate than the alternative. And to our surprise, when we take you know, so what we have here is that FFTNS1 is math fastest method. Uh, um, and so we took these methods, they are nice because you can provide any guide tree you want, okay? And so we have two guide tree, we have embed, these are the cluster omega guide trees, and we have part tree. These are the math fastest trees you can get. And so here you can take as the tree methods part tree, you can take as an MSA algorithm FFTNS1, and you can do the non-regressive alignment. That is a default alignment, the progressive. In that case, it's a progressive alignment and it's going to align your sequences progressively. And the readout you get is 29. You get 29% of the columns correctly aligned, of the, of the pairs of uh, structures correctly aligned. Then you can use exactly the same guide tree, exactly the same aligner, but you can use it in a regressive way. And there you have a significant improvement. When you do this with embed trees, you get a slight disimprovement. When you do this with part tree and clustal O, you get a very significant improvement. And when you do it with embed and clustal O, you get an improvement that happens to be statistically significant. Now, the beauty of this, the beauty of this analysis is that the only ingredient, the only component that varies between this colon and that colon is actually the interpretation of the guide tree, everything else is identical. It's the same aligner, it's the same aligning engine, and it's the same guide tree. Okay. Now, uh, 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 unfortunately, <clears throat> we are not there yet because uh, if you just take your tiny data sets, you know, the 2015 sequences with a known structure, and if you align them together, you get significantly more accurate alignment. You see, you're at 51%. So that's what we were saying before. You get 10 structures, 10 sequences with a known structure. You align them, you get 50% accuracy. Then you put in thousands and thousands of homologs. You align these things, you go down to 40%. That's a little bit problematic. That's actually very problematic. Here, you should not be at 50%. You should be at 100% or at 90%, but you're not. And so we, at that stage, we haven't yet solved the solution. But there is something else that is quite interesting, which is that because we are now only aligning tiny data set, tiny subsets, you know, never more than 1,000 sequences, we are not anymore limited to the large scale methods. We can apply into the regressive algorithm the small scale, highly accurate methods. And for instance, we know that GINC, GINC1, is one of the most accurate methods currently available to align sequences. It's, uh, it's, uh, GINC is, uh, is a very smart implementation of the uh, 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 consistency-based algorithm of TCOFI, but it's very, very, it's done very efficiently, very small, and it delivers very accurate alignment. But now we can deploy this GINC. GINC can hardly deploy. Uh, the, the math people recommend 200 as a maximum. You can go to 1,000 if you have a big computer, but you cannot go beyond this. You know the consistency is a killer. The consistency is cubic with a number of sequences, so it increases very fast. But
But here, we never have to align more than 1,000 sequences. So we do it. And there, the accuracy jumps significantly. You know, It goes to 50% with a spare score, which is another, uh, it's, an, it's not a progressive uh, algorithm of math. We go to 51%, okay? So these kind of things are very impressive. Of course, we don't have any non-regressive readout here because you cannot align GINC with a non-regressive uh, 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 algorithm in a non-regressive way at that scale, at the scale we were looking at, okay? And, uh, uh, you know, it runs, uh, it, it not only do you get better alignments, but, but it tends to run faster. It tends to run significantly faster. Uh, in the case of stress score, it's a little bit tricky to compare the CPU time, but they're roughly in par. And so it runs faster or it simply runs in the case of GIMC, which would have been non-tractable. So now this is uh, this thing here represents, uh, you know, usually when you have these new methods, you have a trade-off between uh, improved accuracy and, uh, and, and lower CPU time. And so here, most of the time, we get lower CPU times, these are the green arrows, and higher accuracy. We get uh, one of these goes with a lower accuracy. That's the only uh, arrow we get in this direction. And here, we got a slightly, with spare score, what I was mentioning before, a slightly higher CPU time, but that's still, you know, normally that, that, that suggests comparable complexity, okay? And then here, we have these guys. They have no arrow because we have no non-regressive implementation of these things. And of course, they stand in the nasty corner, lots of CPU time, but the good corner, high accuracy, okay? So does this scale? For the, for the paper, we had to show that this was scaling above HomFam because HomFam was limited in, uh, in size to, uh, I think the largest HomFam data set is about 100,000 uh, 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 sequences. And so we assembled our own data set, which had no reference in that case, it were just very large data sets. And we were able to show that the regressive was able to align what was at the time the largest data set we were able to assemble, 1.5 million sequences. That's the ABC transporter, okay? And so, uh, uh, as you can see here, the non-regressive are limited to a maximum of 240,000 sequences, uh, uh, but, but in this case, we had no limitation. And had we had larger data sets, we could have handled them because uh, the really, you know, what, the only thing you're doing is that you are computing uh, a lot of small alignments. And the only limiting factor is having enough disk space to write your alignment. Because when you write to disk space, you write a lot of gaps. And so we are now actually using a compacted format where we simply write the number of gaps rather than writing the actual gaps. And that makes a lot of things possible, okay? So this is just another rendering of the number of sequences before failure. And as you can see here, the, 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 so here in, in, in the case of these things, uh, um, uh, the, the non-regressive, the regressive. In case of this thing, uh, uh, I'd have to check what was the issue. But uh, we had, um, we had. So a limiting factor was embed. Embed. We were not able to compute embed trees with more than two hundred thousand sequences. There is a limitation in embed. And so if you provide the correct guide tree, then you can do things the right way. Now, uh, uh, I've already shown that stuff. And so I'm going to, sorry, time is running out. So I just want to maybe, uh, yeah. So this is, uh, yeah. The next step of course is uh, what I've, um, I'm sorry. The next step is what I mentioned before this homology extension. You remember this result is psychophy being very accurate and a major limiting step in, uh, in the regressive algorithm is how good you're going to be with your first alignment, you know, the parent alignment, the one where you put together all the most distantly related sequences. And the answer is that this is where you have to work. And so what we are now trying to do is we are trying to build on this uh, psychophy stuff. How does psychophy work? I did not really mention it. So if you have a pair of sequences that are very distantly related, you know, you have these two residues here. You have a lucine here, a lucine here, and you don't really know which leucine wants to go with which leucine. You have no objective way of telling this leucine apart. But if you associate every sequence with a profile, you're going to find out that, aha, uh -huh, this leucine here, it never changes. It's highly conserved, which is a bit unusual for a leucine. Leucine, you know, they're usually easy to turn into valine and these kind of things. 
while on the other side, you get this leucine here, and well, you know, it's, it's a standard leucine. It turns into isoleucine, valine, all these things. While that leucine here, it has the same uh, <coughs> evolutionary pattern as the other one, and you probably want to match these two columns together. And that's exactly how psychophy works, how promults work, and how all these homology extended things work. They're very slow because uh, BLAST is slow. And so <coughs> we're trying now to see if uh, MM search will work. But the trick with MM search is that you have to do all your BLAST at the same time. So it's a slightly different implementation. <coughs> the scale up to 1 million sequences is tricky. It's actually as tricky as uh, spinning. <laughs> Sorry about the title, but it's needed, OK? And, uh, and so this thing uh, was published in uh, Nature Biotech about a year ago already, a bit more than a year ago now. And uh, <clears throat> we are working actively on the follow-up. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, we, we also have to incorporate in all these analyses the tree instability. It is very important. We have to be able to guess what are the bad branches. And so that's one of the things we're actively working on, trying to get what are try, trying to improve the tree by guessing what are the branches that are going to contribute negatively to the alignment and possibly realign things at a lower level. That's one of the things we are doing very actively. And we are, for instance, adding instability to the standard bootstrap measurement. That's Unistrap. So you remember earlier during this talk, I told you that when you have, when you're changing, when you're shuffling the order in which you're aligning your sequences, you get some instability. Okay, what can you do with this? Well, we implemented Unistrap. And in Unistrap, we are simply asking if the bootstrap, the Felsenstein bootstrap, will decrease when rather than doing one round of bootstrap, you realign your sequences several times. And as you can see here, a large number of branches, which will have a high bootstrap in, uh, in, 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 uni, in, in, in a standard Felsenstein bootstrap, turn out to have a lower bootstrap in the unit strap. We are decreasing the bootstrap. And that's very good because it means that these branches that turn out to be unstable when you change the order in which you align the sequences. Well, these branches cannot be really trusted, but it's unit strap. It's a reshuffling that we are doing here that will allow you figuring out the branches you cannot trust, okay? And so this is the example we give in the paper. So this is, for instance, these are branches that have a bootstrap superior to 80 when you use Felsenstein bootstrap only one replicate, one multiple alignment with, with the Felsenstein replicate, and the branches that have a bootstrap support lower than 50 when you do 100 unistrap replicate, when you change the order of your sequences 100 times, okay? And you can tell it's, it's a tiny fraction, but it's still a sizable fraction of the branches. It's still a sizable fraction of the branches that you will confuse for correct branches. And this is going to be very important in the regressive algorithm because we have to know what are the branches that are trustworthy. You know, the noise added by the tree in these alignments is really, really nasty. So I'll finish by something very, very low level. And I'm almost done, two minutes. And I'll finish with something very low level, but essential. How do we do all this computation? You know, we're talking about millions of computation here, all the bootstrap, all the replicates. And for this, we have developed something called Nextflow. And Nextflow has become amazingly successful over the last years. I understand that, for instance, uh, uh, several pharma companies are running all their pipelines in Nextflow now. All the vaccine stuff in several companies is actually running with Nextflow, which is quite exciting. I don't think I'm allowed to tell you which companies, but these are some of the big ones. And the thing is that Nextflow enables reproducible computational workflows. You know, the beauty of Nextflow is that even if you change computer, even if you change flavors of Unix, whatever, you are going to rerun exactly the same computation. That has been an essential part of our work. It is something that has made everything we do possible with limited manpower. You know, we, we don't have so many people in the lab, so we need to have this kind of thing that, 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 that make it possible to deploy the computation. Very recently, and I'll finish with this, we, uh, some members of the group took part in the NF core framework, which is, uh, it's a new, it's a new, um, <clears throat> it is both a new Nextflow standard 
and a collection of pipeline, of reference pipeline that, uh, that follows this standard. And so it's something very important. In a way, NF core is like the viral capsid of Nextflow, okay? And this is uh, dramatically increasing the success of Nextflow. I think we have something like, um, I can't remember the name, but I think they've had about 200,000 downloads of Nextflow this last year. So this is, this is massive, uh, this is massively popular, okay? So let me conclude. The regressive algorithm is faster, more accurate, more versatile. So we are very happy, but we are still very far from where we should be. We have to be uh, uh, at least one or two orders of magnitude. We have to aim for one or two orders of magnitude, more sequences to be dealt with in an accurate way. And one of the things that I find extremely exciting are the latest development with AlphaFold, uh, AlphaFold 2, that are going to, to really define a new era for sequence analysis with structures increasingly present. And of course, this defines uh, unstructured regions. I know you had a, a lecture on unstructured regions. This defines unstructured protein region as the new frontier because we have to do something with these things. They do not evolve the same way. They cannot be compared the same way, but they contain information that has to be effectively processed. And none of the methods I described today are able to process this data uh, uh, as well as it should be, okay? And so uh, 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 all of the things I have shown you are available on our website. They're available for free. Uh, Unistrap, we've been a little bit slow on uh, implementing the method. And so you can try it, but this is still a bit experimental. The regressive algorithm is in production. It should work. And so you can, you can incorporate it in any analysis you do. I'd like to thank everybody who has been involved in these projects at one point or another. And, uh, and uh, that's most of the group, but these are, these are the collaborators that have been the most, uh, the, the most prominent on these things. And uh, I'll thank you for your attention. It's been a very long talk. Uh, many of you are probably uh, sleeping in front of their computer now, but thanks, thank, thanks for, for bearing with me all this time. Thank you. Thank you, Segrik, for the beautiful lecture, very comprehensive. And I think there is time for questions. A question from Rita. I may wait if there are students. Not yet. I invite all the students to So I have a very general participate. question for Cedric. My question is relative to the problem of decently related homologs. That it's a really a problem uh, to solve. I mean, it's a real problem since it is very difficult to grasp them on the basis of sequence alignment whatsoever. So uh, it, it wasn't unclear to me because I didn't pay enough attention or perhaps it was not good enough <laughs> in order to follow exactly what you said. It's, it is unclear to me when you are saying that you are first of all, you know, searching for distantly related homologs or sequences that in principle have a very low sequence identity. What this does mean practically? Uh, well, that means exactly this. So I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from uh, a long time ago. I was working on the kinases. And to my surprise, the big line, you know, the kinases are not so difficult to align. They have the kinase domain, the protein kinase domain, not so difficult to align. The domains have roughly the same length. The, the, the active side, the nucleotide binding side is rock solid conserved. You always get the alignment wrong. And what puzzled me is that if you collect randomly 20 kinases, the alignment is always correct. You know, you can play this game. You take your 500 human kinases. So if you talk about 500 human kinases, you talk about things that have diverged when we were only yeast. <laughs> you know, they have diverged a long time ago, even though they're in our genome. So they are not so easy. They, but still, you take 15 of them, you always get the active site and the nucleotide binding site correctly aligned. And that puzzled me for a long time. And that really was the inspiration behind this. And so the truth is that a critical parameter here is N. N has to be large enough. If N is too small, your progressive algorithm is going to fail at aligning your distant homologs. So you need an N that is at least 100. You know, If N is 20 or something like this, because you collect sequences that are so distantly related, you fail. But if N is large enough, on a normal protein family, you are going to be able to collect 
sequences that are sufficiently close together to be aligned, to be the backbone of your alignment. But still, we have to improve, and that's where I was trying to finish the, the, the seminar. So for instance, uh, I think that one of the dramatic improvement we're gonna see is when we manage to turn the original alignment of the distantly related sequences into a structure-based alignment, because there, the problem of distant homology will be solved. And as long as AlphaFold delivers usable models for these distantly related structures, then you have a backbone of a highly accurate backbone of distantly related sequences. And you can just you know, uh, dress up this backbone with all the intermediate sequences. But the fact that you have a correct backbone is very important because it means that everything that is distantly related is now synchronized nicely to have a good model. So I don't know if this answers your question. I may agree with you, although I think that Alpha Fold before giving us the right, I mean, the whole spectrum of possible structures in the world it will take a while. In any case, uh, I uh, perhaps uh, I was trying to uh, focus on the following. Aren't you uh, using, for example, a pre-filtering with uh, interpro motifs or prosite motifs so as to recognize families eventually building up, I don't know, a big family and then later on exploit this family with your tools? Okay, so it's, a, it's an important, um, you know, so it's a, multiple alignment is a very, you know, it's like an Olympic discipline. It, it's not real life. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you've, ju you've just described real life. And so in that case, it's a set exercise. You already have a bunch of sequences that you know are homologous. And the, 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 um, the comment you made is very important because, uh, you know, on 100 sequences, on 1,000 sequences, it's easy to get sequences that are homologous and you have a clean data set and that's your Olympic games, you know, running 100 meters. But in reality, when you're gonna have a million sequences or, 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 or 10 million sequences, this will be full of noise. And we don't know yet how to deal with this noise. It is something that we have to invent because uh, there will be sequences that are not homologous. There will be sequences that are not members of the family. There, there will be plenty of things. And so it, it's a slightly different exercise. It is something that is a little bit upstream, but because of the growth of the databases, the, all of these things are going to come together. And inside the multiple alignment, we're gonna have to have some, uh, some filtering uh, uh, some filtering capacity. And if you remember a couple of years ago, this was a project with Leila, who's one of the students from Bologna, where we were trying to recognize the sequences that should be eliminated from the alignment because given a limited amount of structural information, these sequences are not happy. And we're actually writing up this, this, this as a paper these days so that it is something that is still ongoing. But yes, looking, that's an important part. Looking forward to read it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you for the lecture. Other questions, please? A question from uh, Castrense. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Hello. Just a curiosity about the benchmarking of the different tools uh, for, for aligning, uh, for building multiple sequence alignment. So the, the, my question is, uh, you compare basically the outcome of these tools uh, with an alignment taken from structural alignments. That's correct. Do, yes. do you always score when you compute the sum of pairs score? Do you always score all the pairs the same way? Because in the structural alignment, you have maybe different regions. You may have yeah, yeah, regions yeah. corresponding to secondary structure or more flexible regions. So do you score uh, all the pairs in the same way or maybe you downweight uh, pairs that are maybe, I don't know, part of flexible regions or Mm. So there, there, there are different schools for this. Uh, um, uh, uh, the original Bali base was annotated and was annotated with a core region. So you will only you will only score. Uh, sorry, I just saw that there was a Slack, there was a chat, there was something on the chat. Yeah, so there is a, a yeah, question. there is a oh, no, that, that, that's saying, yeah. saying that you okay. gave a very good lecture <laughs> and he has to leave and he okay. says. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Roberto. Um, no, so uh, uh, in the first one, Bali base, they were annotating the columns and they were getting rid of all the loops it's because, you know, the loops are not superposable. So it will be unfair to, uh, 
to, to, to count them against a method. Then uh, 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 in other ones like um, in in, uh, in other ones like uh, uh, I, I had negotiated uh, one o'clock with the dogs and then so I think there, there is a, there is a bit of a revolution now. And uh, in uh, in in another one like uh, like the prefab one, they did several alternative structural alignments and they only consider the weight the column by the consistency across the structural alignment. And so they only consider the columns where the structural aligners agree, basically. In the last one, in OMFAM, everything is considered. Why? Because if you observe in reality, even though you should not consider the, column, the, the, the loops and all these kind of things, it does not change the relative ranking of the methods. That's the empirical observation that has goes on through the year. So, you, the measure you get is not anymore a measure of true structural accuracy because you're taking into account regions you should not take into account, but it's a reasonable proxy to the estimation of, uh, 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 to, to the ranking of the structural accuracy of your sequence aligner. And so that's the reason why everybody has kind of moved in, you know, you put everything in and it does not matter so much. Uh, we've been trying more sophisticated things like using the consistency, for instance. And uh, uh, for instance, we, we found something quite nice recently. If you do your structure, if you do your ab initio structural predictions uh, 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 of sequences of the same family, if the structural alignment has a low consistency, a low agreement between the pairs, usually the structural predictions are not good. And so that allows you to discard some of the structural prediction, this kind of thing. So we, we can play with these things. But for, for the ranking, you don't have to. For, for, for a, a precise estimate of accuracy, it will be useful. For, for the ranking, it does not really matter. OK, thank you. Thank you. More questions? I have a curiosity about the fact that uh, different uh, sorting of the sequences give different results that astonished me. And I understood and I didn't thought before about the presence of uh, uh, equivalent uh, alignments. And this explains two thirds of the... Uh, yes. And the other third? Yeah. Is, is there any idea on the other third of the... Um, I don't know. It's a good one. And um, I, uh, I, I, think, I think it's, uh, I, we, we, we speculate on this one, on the other third. And the other third could be, um, the other third could be that you don't get exactly the same tree, you see, because uh, the trees are typically based on percent identity. Mm. And, uh, and with a lot of sequences, you have a lot of ties. So you may get three that are actually topologically different because the sequences are simply going to be compared pair by pair and the input order will have, a, uh, will have an influence on the way the tree reconstruction methods break the ties. And so I think it is the other third, but that, that's only a speculation because uh, I will need to uh, rip open the guts of the tree reconstruction <laughs> methods and, 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 and it's different ballgame. But that's one of the things we want to try to do with, with, with Olivier Gasquiel. So Olivier is the author of FireMail and he's a, okay. it's quite a big name on the, on the tree side. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gigi. More questions from the audience, from the students, PhD students? Okay, so thank you very much, Cedric, for this well, lecture. Thank you we... all. And then to the students, thank you, Rita. To the students, <laughs> you know, just send any question you may have by mail or when you try the methods, do not do not hesitate to send any question and we'll be we'll be happy to help and to uh, to, 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 to to help using all these methods. And, and, and thanks we a lot hope... for your attention. We hope you will teach uh, the student bioinformatics next September as usual. So I, I, I hope so. I hope so. I'm still waiting. I, I have not received my delicious Italian food. I'm, I'm waiting for the delivery. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a lot of cycling. The home delivery. Okay. <laughs> we will try to organize. Cycling, huh? so, 
Many regards to the whole family, including the cats, okay? It's a dog, 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 dog. This is going to escalate, Rita. This is going to escalate. <laughs> including the cats. I didn't say not excluding the dog, but including the cats. Do you have cats, I suppose, being... No, the neighbors no? have cats. And this Didn't is you say that you had a cat? Okay. So, no, we sorry. have the, the neighbor cat. The neighbor okay. cat is, is, ah, is, okay. playing, is playing games with our dogs. And then that, and that, 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 that's so another story. That's my another apologies story. only to dogs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, well, thank you to everybody. I remind you... A big hug to everybody. Thank you. I remind everybody that the next lecture will be on Thursday the 25th at nine in the morning, so earlier than usual. It will be given by Paolo Carloni from uh, the Hulich uh, Institute for Advanced Simulation, and he will key some, give some insight on key molecular mechanism of synaptic transmission from uh, simulation, so from computer simulation. So uh, stay tuned. We are trying also to uh, reschedule the lecture of uh, Professor Corominas and maybe to add some more lectures. So uh, pay attention to the mail. We know that some, uh, in some cases, our mail goes to the spam. So I have a look also to the spam directory. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good lunch. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 B